This very, very sad thing is my backup vault. So the only thing this PC has been doing for the last couple of years is turn on at 12 p.m. Uh, pulling all the data from my server to its uh, big array of old hard drives and then turn off again to wait another 21 hours or so to do the same thing all over again. And uh, uh, it has been doing an admirable job, what for being a machine dating to 2008 or something with its Core 2 Duo CPU and a P5Q Pro motherboard and various random disks in between. However, since uh, we are migrating to all new NASI stuff here with a new FreeNAS build chugging along in actual production now, uh, this thing is no good anymore. Because this thing runs on a Windows Server platform, it's just got a bog standard Server 2008 uh, R2 installation, which is excellent for uh, sucking up NTFS uh, file systems. It uh, has been set to just write of copy my drives from the server and that's worked very well. However, since we're now doing ZFS with FreeNAS, uh, we're going to be using ZFS replication for our backups instead. And uh, that does not like the hardware in this thing because ZFS loves uh, buffering stuff in RAM and while we do have fancy gaming RAM in this thing, uh, it is not ECC or buffered. So this RAM could potentially cause some issues down the road, uh, corrupting our data and destroying our entire file system, uh, which uh, supposedly, according to the internet, ZFS is rather sensitive to. Uh, in NTFS, we would just see uh, something go a bit wrong, whereas in ZFS, with our whole big array of drives, uh, something could just destroy the entire file system due to one bit swap that's not Courts, according to the internet anyway. Uh, so we are guarding ourselves against that by moving to a new platform, or rather an old platform, because this thing, lacking its face, is a 2007 uh, IBM X3200 server. Uh, so this thing was, I think, retired relatively recently. It's got a ridiculous amount of hours on it, but it does seem to be working quite fine. And I've upgraded this thing with 8 gigs of RAM, so it actually should meet the minimum requirements for running FreeNAS. Uh, the CPU in this thing is dog slow. It's a Xeon 3040, uh, which is a 65 nanometer first gen Core 2 Duo running at 1.87 gigahertz. So it's a uh, one of the absolutely slowest servers you could get your hands on even at the time, let alone today. But since this thing won't be chewing crypto, uh, it really doesn't matter. All we need is the ECC RAM and good system stability that IBM is sure to provide. And yes, indeed, we are talking IBM, not even Lenovo. So that we're doing the proper big blue build. Uh, so, uh, what's going to be going down with this thing is rather unique because whereas the old machine has been set to uh, use a BIOS timer to turn on once a day and then a script in Windows to turn off, uh, the IBM server, being a server, doesn't have that feature because why would you want to turn on your server on a schedule? It's a bloody server, it's supposed to be on 24-7. And... Uh, I'm sure there's some clever wake on land thing and a jig you could use to get around that, but uh, me being me, I've used a mechanical timer. So this is one of a couple of four channel uh, digital timers I use around the house. They are industrial, very old, very basic, but very, very reliable, and they just use three watts in standby. Uh, so this thing has four relay outputs, only two of them work on this thing since I was too cheap to <laughs> replace all four relays. Uh, but that's all we need. So uh, this thing is now configured to turn on uh, two of the channels, one going to the live and one going to the neutral, uh, going to the server. So you can see we actually have a power cord of the server there, going into a timer and then power into the timer coming from the wall. And then we have a small addition I've built, and this is a 
a manual turn on input. So this connector goes straight to the relay choke on the two channels there. Uh, meaning that uh, if we put 12 volts in here, uh, those two channels are going to turn on. And that's very important because uh, this server is going to be chewing a varying amount of data. In one day I might have added a gigabyte to the NAS and another day I might have added a terabyte or removed a terabyte and it could take hours for this poor old thing to pull all that data over its single gigabit link. So we really can't just program the timer to turn the PC off at a set time because uh, really that's that just adds an incredible risk of turning off in the middle of an important file operation which could also ruin our uh, file system even more so than just having bad RAM I would wager. So this plug gets around that because the way this is set up right now is the timer turns on the power to the server which is set to turn on as soon as it receives power. But then we have this little thing hooking to a DC jack output on the back, going into the enable input on the timer. Meaning that as soon as the server turns on, this timer can no longer turn off because the relay coil is being powered by the server. So we can actually go on these manual run switches for the relays, and they do nothing because the server is keeping the relays on. However, if we are to be so rude as to, yeah, can we get this in shot? As to yank this plug, the server dies. And uh, now it will no longer turn on if we do that because the timer is also turned off. So this is going to provide a pretty decent automation platform for timing this server to be on and off. Now, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, uh, me being a hardware guy, I'm not too concerned about the software bugging up and causing some issue, but I am concerned about stuff like spikes on a power grid, bad power supplies. I don't want this thing, this poor old power supply, to be hooked up 24-7 uh, with a potential of uh, any lightning strike or something like that just going in there and wreaking havoc on my backup machine. There's no point for this thing to be connected up to the power grid 24 seven. And having the live and neutral pins of a post ball disconnected uh, provides just an extra layer of protection against that. So what we're gonna be doing now is uh, taking the hard drives of your backup machine and shoving it in this machine, uh, as well as adding a, one or two new drives uh, to allow for redundancy. However, we do have a slight problem. Uh, whereas the big NAS chassis has uh, six hot swap bays, uh, this guy only has four. And uh, that's uh, no good for the, the sizes of drives we, we use and we need at least five. So we're gonna have to start by trying to fit a couple of those 525 hot swap bays uh, out of the Windows server into uh, the backup machine. It's uh, gonna be a bit of an issue because uh, Sadly, uh, IBM have this silly thing going on where they don't have any mains uh, on the uh, far away side of a drive caddy. You can't even access that side if you take the uh, right hand side panel off. So uh, mounting those uh, hot swap bases is going to be a major bother, but uh, we'll figure it out. All right, so I've extracted my uh, cheaper eBay 525 inch SATA hot swap base and uh, the issue with mounting these in these cases which don't have a mounting screws on the right hand side is uh, this mount does not have a standard 525 inch uh, a distance down to the bottom there. You might even be able to tell that uh, the plastic from there goes further down than the metal bracket. So when you try and mount this in a case it just goes and doesn't sit right and it just makes everything janky and horrible and with these uh, flimsy Chinese things you, well, don't need any more horrible jankiness than you already got. So, to remedy that, I have taken the original CD-ROM which shipped with the IBM server. It had failed due to a bad uh, eject mechanism that's uh, no longer playing ball. 
and still in its case I took an angle grinder to it and I have created a couple of uh, side panels for these uh, 525 inch hot swap base so these are going to go on like so and by putting these on here they're of course the standard CD-ROM height so we get the uh, extra couple of centimeter, uh, millimeters we need to actually allow this uh, device to rest on the support that exists inside the case and I've already made it on the other one here and you can see there we have our CD-ROM mount and this is actually sliding perfectly fine onto the metal rails and this is sitting not perfectly sturdy but as sturdy as the case allows and most importantly it's not sagging to the side even if I lower that down it is actually leveled so that's uh, gonna allow a reasonable hot swapping experience now there are our beautiful hot swap base installed so uh, the wiring loom of this machine uh, deserves its own segment because it's uh, complete not a cancer and it's uh, been that way from the factory uh, so what's going on in this mess is uh, the original factory hot swap base the quad bay has uh, power going to it through four molex extenders so there are four molex to molex uh, just connections going on here uh, and uh, then aside from that you get one molex and a bunch of satis for your external hardware which is very generous however my crappy uh, hotspot base have molex uh, inputs so i'm having to use the only molex splitter i have which is a ridiculously giant uh, one to three molex so uh, yeah we're just splitting off a million molexes here shouldn't be an issue really there's no huge amount of wiring and no huge power load on any of these but it does make uh, wire management completely impossible uh, we also need to get some kind of better ssd mount that's just placed on top of that for the time being uh, i'm gonna end up probably zip tying the power for this uh, the timer hold out but it is something probably like so uh, oh yeah the way I derived the timer output was to just uh, cut off the PCI Express power connector thing which seems to be kind of proprietary since it's missing a pin there uh, and uh, again enough of that so this is just 12 volts going out through a DC jack on the back of the case uh, I was very lucky that uh, IBM provided these little a holy thing is there which you, you can just shove a screwdriver in and uh, take out and they fit perfectly with this little cable main to DC pluggy things you can get for cheap on eBay so that was a real stroke of luck uh, but yeah we really have a point now to we can start to uh, install and free NAS and uh, configuring that and once we're done uh, loading it up with all our uh, old backup disks and wiping them and being completely without a backup for a while. Uh, Hardware-wise, this server actually has a an LSI uh, controller there for the uh, hot swap base. This is an ancient controller in IR mode, and it uh, only has support for up to 2.2 terabyte drives in IT mode, which I haven't managed to flash anyway. So this thing is actually due for replacement. I'm gonna I have ordered one of those IBM M1015, I think they're called, a RAID cards to go in the 8x PCIe slot there. To the left, they provide eight SATA connectors. So we're going to be running everything off of one of those in due time, but it's going to take months for that to arrive from China. All right, a few days have passed. Uh, I don't remember what the last thing I shot was, but that doesn't matter because we've got ourselves a lovely IBM 1015 RAID card to play with. So, uh, since the internal uh, RAID card of the IBM server could not handle our big uh, drives over two terabytes, uh, we've had to order one of these. And a lovely local viewer offered to lend me his uh, until such time that I get mine. So, uh, we've got a bit of a head start on this project. So, these are LSI based devices. Uh, very cheap on eBay, like uh, uh, 20 euros, 30 euros or so shipped. 
since they were manufactured in massive quantities and this one even seems to be brand new. Uh, so we got the card, we got a couple of uh, SATA to uh, weird SAS adapter cables with some very very thin SATA <laughs> cables in there. Uh, so we are pretty much ready to get going on this thing. However, uh, we are going to need to reflash this card to run in IT mode because by default this ship as RAID controller, as hardware RAID controller, and that's no good for the ZFS. So it's time to boot into a USB key and get terminaling. Oh yeah, I should probably, I should probably install the card first. That's that, that that's a good idea. Shut up. Rip forever proprietary weird RAID controller, but we don't need that anymore. No one's going to pay anything for this on eBay either. There we go, everything's done successfully, so hopefully this is just going to work now. And uh, the next step is going to be adding the discs. So these are all my backup discs, uh, and I've already put some of them in the caddies we have. Two three terabyte uh, WD reds and two four terabyte WD reds and these four terabyte guys, I am uh, afraid of wiping because uh, these right now contain the only backup copy of my data. Well, together with these guys, uh, that's uh, not on the actual NAS. So once we go into free NAS and uh, choose to make a big pool out of all of these guys if the only data safety i'm gonna have is uh, gonna be the redundant drives in the actual operating nas so we're gonna have exactly one drive security and that's going to be a driving operation until such time that this thing has ingested all the data again uh, scary 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 but we're gonna have much better redundancy and security once this is done, for sure. Okay, there we go. All the disks installed. Ready for the first startup. So this is hopefully going live with all the proper disks, all the proper gear, all the proper tornado. Of a backup machine. And would you look at that? We have all our drives appearing as they should, which means that uh, Freeness is going to be angry with us since we're putting four and three terabyte disks together, but uh, alas, what can you do? These are the disks, disks we have to work with, so we're going to be losing two terabytes of storage, but oh well. So, this is a big moment when I click that button, all of my backup data, two copies of my backup data are going to be destroyed. Wow, this is the first time I've been without a backup for years. Goodbye, goodbye NTFS. We've had a good run. And then we have our brand new 10.5 terabyte backup storage volume made up entirely out of uh, <laughs> disregarded disks from the, all my old NASs. So uh, the next step now is to just uh, put this thing back together really hardware wise, we're done. Uh, and uh, take it downstairs so it can ingest a base replication of a main NAS, which uh, has a similar 10.5 terabyte drive in it. Should be very similar, uh, but we've got 6.75 terabytes of data to chew into this thing at about uh, 700 megabits. So, this is gonna take a while. And there we are, all installed in TV server closet thing. So, 
Uh, we haven't got the timer set up yet because uh, I don't need the timer for the initial ingest. So uh, we're just going to be powering this thing on and uh, it's going to be chewing data for days and days. Beautiful. I should be getting some picture there. So uh, this thing should boot all right. It's all set up and ready to go. So the rest can be done over the network. Goodbye. Well, who am I kidding? I'm going to turn off the monitor and lights anyway. Okay, there we go. I've got both machines up and running. So we're on the main NAS now. We're adding uh, our replication job in free, the free NAS web GUI. So uh, this is basically just going to be running all the time now, since it's the first time we're doing it. And it's going to just be chewing data forever. So hopefully, once we do that, uh, we're going to be seeing a little symbol pop up and uh, our data transfer is going to go absolutely ballistic for quite a few hours. Quite a few hours indeed. And there we go, we've got the little dancing replication symbol up at the top of the main nurse. And the poor backup machine is ingesting data at saturated gigabit link speed. So I'm very pleasantly surprised at the performance of this machine, even though it's running a 1.87 gigahertz Xeon from 2006, uh, it's still managing to saturate a gigabit link as long as all encryptions and stuff is turned off. So that's a huge relief. Actually, I was very afraid start of this project that this thing would just be able to do like 30 megabytes a second, which would uh, be an absolute pain. But uh, Thankfully, that's not the case. Not that this isn't gonna take long enough already. Yeah, in fact, yeah. I think we're pretty much on the edge. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> so there's a repair meter for the server room and this usually uses uh, about 85 watts when it's just sitting around. So we have well over a hundred watts going into nothing but that poor backup PC. Okay, so I guess we can't get around actually explaining some of the software for getting this backup system to work. It's uh, very ugly and I'm definitely no software engineer, but here's what I've come up with. So it's a bit tricky since one of the computers is going to be off most of the time and it has to turn off automatically once a certain task is finished. And it's reasonably easy to do that in FreeNAS, thankfully. I think this system is gonna work anyway. Uh, so this is based around uh, the two machines. We have the main NAS here to the left and the backup NAS here to the right and uh, the backup NAS is running a cron job and the main NAS is just running a, an automatic replication task set up very out of the box standard issue. Uh, so what makes this work is SSH and shell scripting. Uh, so I have set up so that both of these machines can SSH to each other. Uh, we need to do that uh, from the backup NAS to the main NAS in order to uh, find out if a replication is running because we only see that as uh, a file appearing on the main NAS since that's doing all the work. The backup NAS is just kind of sitting there doing nothing. Uh, and we need the main NAS to be able to SSH into the backup NAS in order to turn it off after it's done. So uh, if we go through what's going to happen, uh, so the timer for the backup piece is going to turn on and it's going to start up and it's gonna be running this cron job which is disabled right now which is called a query for shutdown and if we go into the terminal uh, so what, what this script does is it sshs into the main nas at 1021 and it runs another script shutdown backup after replication and that script has a little bit of magic inside and we can look at that uh, it's got an if thingy 
going. Uh, I had a friend help me set that up. Thank you. And uh, what this does is it see, checks if this file exists. And that file only exists while a replication is running. So when this thing is going, it's copying files, that, that file is gonna exist. And when it's done, this file gets deleted. So what this script does is if uh, the file does not exist, it's gonna run this command. And it should be rather obvious what that does is it SSHs into the back of PC and uh, shuts it down. Uh, and if it isn't running, well, it just uh, skips the whole in inside of this if thingy and uh, it's done, it does nothing. And uh, then we wait for the whole thing to start over. Uh, this cron job on the back of PC is set to run once every 10 minutes. So we're gonna give it another 10 minutes to uh, keep copying. Then uh, the backup PC is gonna SSH into the main PC, run the script. The script is gonna check if the replication is running. And uh, we do that a few times, depending on how big the chunk of data we need to copy is. And finally, uh, the replication is gonna be done. This file is gonna disappear and uh, this command is gonna run. So we can easily demonstrate how well this works since we don't have a replication running right now. Uh, we can just uh, run this cron job right now and uh, what should hopefully happen is uh, this thing is gonna say, I'm going down now. There we go. And uh, that's just gonna kill the backup NAS and turn it off. And now we wait for another day or two until the mechanical timer turns the PC back on. And the whole thing repeats itself. So with all the hardware and all the software done, all that's left to do is to head back down into the server room and go live. And that's indeed what's happened because well, you can see the timer with this wiring powering the back of the machine. So, uh, all I've done really, last uh, step was to configure this timer to uh, turn on on a good schedule. So, uh, the setup, let's see. You can see it's going to turn on at 9 in the morning and turn off at 9.05. Uh, and uh, that's gonna be enough time for the server to turn on and sustain the power through this uh, sustained input. And then the server's just gonna boot up, the main NAS is gonna do its replication, this guy's gonna figure out that's done, and uh, then it's gonna query the main NAS to turn off, and then it'll turn off, and since the uh, timer's powered by the sustained input, it's just gonna go click and turn off. And indeed, that's what's happening right now. I'll have a monitor over there. So in just a second, this guy's gonna go black. And now it can no longer turn on. The blinking parallelity is no more. Excellent. So we'll just put this on auto. Uh, exit programming mode. Close it up. And be on our way. Because this should now, in theory, take care of itself. Backups every second day. I uh, don't care for the daily backups, that's just a waste of time since we do have one drive redundancy in the main NAS over there. I don't think losing a day of data if two drives go bad in that is a risk worth considering. So, with that, I'm going to have to thank you for watching and uh, make sure you enjoy yourself.